Kasten, perhaps. I don't know whether my pronunciation is correct or not. So I will have a very brief introduction of him first. So Kasten, I think he's originally from Germany, and then he got his, uh, he, he did his PhD there, and then he, uh, he goes for his postdoc work at UC Berkeley. And he recently joined John Hopkins University. His research area includes about the organic contaminants removal and also analysis. So I think his talk today, will, he will share with us about the occurrence and the fate of organic pollutants in the wastewater treatment plants. So with a brief introduction, let's welcome uh, Kasten, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope, <clears throat> I hope everybody can hear me. I'm sorry, I'm, I have a bit of a sore throat this morning, so, but I'm hoping um, you guys can hear me well. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. And hopefully, just a second. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can see your PPT, yeah. <coughs> where we okay. are. Perfect. Um, yeah, so thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to give this lecture here. Um, I guess I'm saying good morning, but um, to other parts of the, of the world, um, it's probably afternoon already. Um, yeah, so this is the first talk. Um, that actually addresses water treatment. So that's why I thought I'm starting my, my, my talk a bit different than I would usually do it. And I'm starting with a brief history of wastewater treatment. Um, I found this very interesting paper from Lofrano in 2010, who talked about the history. And um, one, of these, one of the graphs they had is, is shown here. Um, I think it's interesting and think about how, what wastewater is today to think also a bit about the history. And the first time when wastewater really became an issue was during the Roman times, more than um, 2,000 years ago, um, and mo mostly in Rome, um, because the city grew so large that human waste actually became a huge issue. And the Romans, um, the end Roman engineers were very um, uh, creative in, in developing new, new uh, techniques um, to actually mostly um, get, get rid of the waste, so to say, and transport the, the, the waste out of the city. Mm -hmm. I, found, I found this very interesting interactive map of the water infrastructure in Rome. Um, if people are more interested in that, um, what was apparently um, made at the University of Virginia. But um, it's interesting from the, from the history that after the, Roman, after the Roman Empire collapsed, that there was a time of more than a thousand years where basically uh, wastewater treatment or wastewater in general wasn't addressed at all. And the authors here call it the, se the, so, uh, the sanitary dark ages. And it was really only un until like 200 years ago when, when wastewater treatment came more and more onto the radar again. And it is mostly uh, due to the, the population growth and um, health, health uh, effects and issues that were um, associated with um, to, uh, wastewater. Um, and when we zoom into this Professor Pras, sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's freezing at your first slide. Uh, could you please oh, just, um, uh, oh, it I is? Think you just share again that the work? Okay, let's see. I'm sorry about that. I know, um, I know it's such a technical problem. Yes, we see now the history of the waste of waste of treatment, so it should be all right. Thank you very much. Do you see, let's see. Yeah, everything's going well now. Thank you. Do you see number four now? Yeah, uh, we see the history of waste of water treatment. Do you see the next slide now? Yeah, evolution of, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. sorry for that. Yeah, thank you. Well, interesting, now for me it's, it's frozen. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Let me know if there's another problem. Thank you. Okay, um, but yeah, so most of the technical developments that happened in wastewater treatment really happened in the last 200 years. And uh, in the beginning, um, about 200 years ago, the main, the main uh, reason for treatment was really to get rid of solids that were present in the, in the wastewater. So the so-called primary treatment, um, that, that was followed by, by secondary treatment, um, especially by biofilters. For example, in the US, the first biofilters was um, uh, yeah, in, installed in, in 1901 in Wisconsin Madison. And then um, more, more recently within the last 50, 60 years, um, we also became uh, aware of uh, the, nest, the, the requirement of re removing nutrients uh, from the wastewater. That was mostly due to the fact that eutrophication of surface waters and fish die-offs because of algae growth um, 
became became more and more um, relevant. Um, what's not what's not part of this graph, and that's actually the part that I will be talking about today, is um, more um, about the micropollutant removal, and and I call this uh, here advanced treatment, um, just because. Um, when we think about the conventional treatment for, for example, nutrient removal, um, as we will see, um, our wastewater treatment plants only do, um, um, let, let's say, a mediocre job in, re, uh, in removing most of these micropollutants. So there's a lot of thinking uh, right now in, in, into advanced treatment, how we can actually equip our wastewater treatment plants to deal with the micropollutant removal issue. When we, when we think about um, micropollutants, um, and a very important aspect is actually that in contrast to early uh, problems with wastewater that were, for example, associated with smell, um, a lot of these micropollutants we cannot see or we cannot, we cannot smell. Um, so these developments are strongly associated with the developments actually in analytical chemistry and the uh, detection of mass spectrometry or the development of mass spectrometry, for example, and ever uh, analytical techniques. And most of the technologies that I will be actually talking about, um, especially with high resolution mass spectrometry, they are not even uh, on that time scale. So similar to what I showed before, probably we should extend the arrow up here. Um, and these are developments that have been made in the last um, maybe 20 years. Well, um, the reason why we care about micropollutants um, is, and, or what micropollutants are, is um, that it, it's also associated with um, the modern, our modern society and industrialization. So we're using more and more chemicals in our daily lives. And this is, this is just one example that I'm showing here of the amount of chemicals that we are putting on our, in our daily lives on our bodies. And um, I was, when I first saw these numbers, I was really surprised um, how high they actually are. So in general, or on average, women use 168 chemicals in, for example, body care products or like toothpaste, shampoos. Um, for men, it's, it's not as much as it's about half, but still it's 85 chemicals that we use in our daily lives and that we put directly on our bodies. And these numbers become even higher when we think about the, the number of chemicals that actually are used in our household items, like in detergents and diverse cleaning products. And here we are think we are, the estimates are around 84,000 chemicals that are used in our household items. And a lot of these can potentially end up in the wastewater. And, um, the reason why we care about them, uh, the emission of these compounds is that there have been a variety of studies that have shown actually that um, these impact the ecosystem and potentially also human health. There have been studies showing, for example, um, yeah, uh, mutations in, in frogs. Um, you, there have been fish die-offs because of uh, certain chemicals. Um, I guess one of the most uh, prominent classes of um, micropollutants are estrogen, estrogenic endocrine disruptors. Uh, which have a very high potency already at very, very low concentrations in the, in the nanogram and sometimes, sometimes even in the picogram per liter range. So when we think about the water cycle, um, and that's part of the research that, I, that my group is addressing here at Johns Hopkins, is that we are, we are using um, a lot of different chemicals in our daily lives and all different kinds of um, applications. Uh, in our households, but also, of course, in agriculture. And all these might potentially end up in the environment. When we think about uh, the household consumption, of course, um, and that's what I will be talking about today, wastewater treatment plants really have a central role in, uh, well, potentially preventing the emission of these con contaminants into the water cycle. Um, but uh, as we will see, um, our wastewater treatment plants, at least at this stage, um, don't always do a, a great job. Um, in, in removing these. And again, I think it's important, that's why I, why I started up with the history, it's really important to, to realize that wastewater treatment plants are not equipped or are not originally made um, for the removal of these compounds. They were m mostly um, um, designed to remove uh, the bulk organic matter, but also nutrients. And um, the last um, 20 years, and this is just an overview slide, I, I don't want to go into detail, um, that's just a summary um, of um, results. Um, that is a review that was published in 2014 of 
a variety of different uh, micropollutants that have been detected in, in wastewater influent and effluents. And as you can see, there's a whole different variety of different chemicals from pharmaceuticals to personal care products to industrial chemicals that can be detected. And when you look at the, at, at the, um, at the, y, at the concentration axis, um, you see that these concentrations vary by basically by four, six, six orders of magnitude. Um, on a global perspective, when you think about um, how are these chemicals, or how are especially pharmaceuticals in this case used on a worldwide uh, basis, um, this is a review that just came out um, this year actually that compared the use or the, 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 the concentration of different um, pharmaceuticals in the influence of wastewater plants worldwide. Comparing them regionally, you can see that there isn't really a big difference among, among a lot of these compounds. Um, which is uh, indicated by this NS, which, uh, which is non-significant. Um, so we're using, we're using a lot of these chemicals worldwide. Um, and a lot of these chemicals, um, and what, that's one of the challenges, they show various removal efficiencies in wastewater treatment plants, in the conventional wastewater treatment plants. So as you can see, when you look at the right side, so these are the, chem the pharmaceuticals or micropollutants that are removed in a very high efficiency. Um, these include, for example, ibuprofen or acetaminophen, but then on the other side, there are also uh, a lot of different chemicals that are only removed by, uh, to, a, to a small fraction. Um, atrazine is here given as the most extreme example, but also carbamazepine um, is typically removed not at all, or not, uh, not, not removed at all. Um, that's why, for example, carbamazepine is today used as a, as a marker for the in, impact of wastewater in the environment. Um, and as a result of these, um, insufficient removal efficiencies in our wastewater treatment plants. And this, is an, um, this is a study um, that has been published um, in Europe where they compared uh, 60 different wastewater treatment plant effluents in this case. You can see that a variety of different compounds can be detected in the effluents of these wastewater treatment plants um, with concentrations again that range from um, the, the low nanogram per liter range up to the microgram per liter range with benzotriazoles these are corrosion inhibitors that we, for example, use in, in dishwashers and detergents or sucralose, um, which is an artificial sweetener. Um, what I will be focused today is, um, and that's a, a class of compound that I've spent um, large parts of my research career on. Um, these are antiviral drugs, um, which are, um, which have, have only become uh, um, more uh, important in more in recent years or um, had, have attracted more attention in more recent years. Antiviral drugs in general are used for viral infections. Um, for example, herpes, as shown here, acyclovir, pencyclovir. Um, acyclovir, or are these compounds are, are interesting because actually the, in the um, invention of these um, got the, the Nobel Prize in, in, in medicine in 1988. Then another class of compounds is, is oseltamivir, which might be known better um, to you uh, under the commercial name tummy flu, uh, which was used for the swine flu um, and its um, uh, um, active metabolite oseltamivir carboxylate. Then um, a class of compound that is um, unfortunately still very important um, is compounds, antiviral drugs that are used for the treatment of HIV. Um, which are, these are just five different um, examples um, that I looked into. Um, and then the last group of uh, antiviral drugs that are used are used for uh, hepatitis, uh, treatment of hepatitis. And when we started looking into these, and this is the first study that actually looked into the occurrence and fate of um, antiviral drugs, um, we, we sampled a wastewater treatment plant in, in Germany. And what we actually, what we actually saw um, is that most of these compounds can indeed also be detected in, in, in the wastewater. And so in green, you see the influent concentrations and in, in, in dark gray, you see the effluent concentrations. So as we can see, there's, um, yeah, these con contaminants enter the wastewater treatment plant in concentrations that range from up to uh, almost two microgram per liter in the case of acyclovir, down to very relatively low concentrations, for example, for nevirapine, which only has like 10 to 20 nanograms per liter. What's interesting with these antiviral drugs, and that's kind of different to what I showed you before with the global use of these compounds because um, HIV is a very big issue in um, sub-Saharan Africa um, 
where um, HIV rates are still, um, yeah, I don't know, um, very, very, very high. When we look at the concentrations of these antiviral drugs actually in wastewater in, in Nairobi, for example, which is the, when you just look at the first two, uh, at the first wastewater treatment plant, the influent and the effluent, um, and uh, the, anti, the antiviral drugs are the last column here in this, in this light gray, you can see that we have concentrations here that are between 10 and 100 micrograms per liter. So very, very high concentrations. What's also interesting when you compare the influent and the effluent, you see that there's only a marginal change. So these compounds, at least in these ways for the treatment plants are very persistent. So they are basically emitted directly into the environment. And we don't, at this point, at least we have no real idea what these compounds do in the environment. Um, a study that we did in Germany in the River Ruhr, which is shown here, where we did a very extensive sampling campaign, um, where we sampled more than uh, 35 locations along the River uh, Ruhr, is um, what we can see here, um, the concentrations of two antiviral drugs, acyclovir and zidovudine. And what you, what, the reason why, why I'm showing this graph here is to clearly show the impact of wastewater treatment plant discharges. Because there were two major treatment plants that, um, that um, discharged into River Ruhr. Um, and these were clearly indicated, or it's clearly indicated by these strong increases of antiviral drugs, especially for like here in uh, Ruhr 20 uh, and RU 24. And also, and I should mention that also the first one here is actually um, after um, the, a, a discharge of one of the biggest wastewater treatment plants there. What was very interesting for um, Osetamivir, the drug that, it's used, that was used for the treatment of the swine flu is that um, we'd only looked for, uh, we didn't only look for Osetamivir, but we also looked for Osetamivir carboxylate, and that's an act, the active metabolite. So Osetamivir, is, it's metabolized in the human liver to Osetamivir carboxylate, which is actually then the active contam uh, compound that, that, um, that works against the virus. And what we saw is when you, when you compare here the different concentrations of both, that they are, uh, you can see that they are, for most of these uh, sampling points, they're in, this, in a similar range. But what was very interesting when you looked at these samples here that are highlighted in red, and these are samples that are taken from the Rhine, so these are the sample points here, you can see that we suddenly see a very high concentration of oseltamivir, whereas the carboxylate, the concentration is similar to what we saw in the other sampling points. The reason why this is surprising is that, because as I mentioned before, oseltamivir is, is metabolized in the human body, uh, in general, by more than 75% to the oseltamivir carboxylate. Um, that means that in general, when you look at the human excretion, you should, you should see ratios that are below one. So you have more of the carboxylate than oseltamivir. And that was true for the influent and the effluents, at least roughly that we saw, and also for surface waters. But for the River Rhine, we saw these um, ratios that were at least an order of magnitude higher. So we saw much more oseltamivir than we would actually anticipate just from the human consumption. And the reason for this, and this was kind of the first um, uh, example of how I got in, um, more interested in transformation products, or in this case, uh, metabolites. The reason for this is actually, and we, we, we could trace it down, that Osetamivir um, was manufactured further down the Rhine, and there was actually an industrial emission of this compound into the Rhine. And just to give you a sense of how much was emitted on a daily basis, at that point at least, um, there were, um, we, we were able to, to, to make it, to do a mass balance. Um, and we came up with a, a 1.8 kilogram per day that were discharged into the Rhine. And this was um, equivalent to, to, equivalent to 12,000 daily doses of this drug that were daily discharged into the river Rhine. So this is, I think, a nice example how uh, just not only looking at parent compounds, but in this case also at metabolites can, can provide valuable information on different um, compounds. But another important aspect is, of course, uh, um, metabolites, um, metabolism is, happen, is happening in, play, uh, in, in humans, but transformations in general can also happen at all different other points of the, of the water cycle. So we have microbial processes that can, for example, take place in wastewater treatment plants. We have photolysis that can be relevant in surface waters. We're using chemical oxidation in our drinking water treatment plants. And all these can potentially lead to transformation products. Um, I want to, because the topic today is wastewater treatment, I just want to focus on this aspect of wastewater treatment plants. 
And I want to give you three examples. So first is um, and using the antiviral drugs that I just introduced. So the first is thinking about, okay, what does activated such treatment do? The second is um, what can we do in terms of new engineering solutions to come up with an advanced wastewater treatment that is specifically designed to remove these micropollutants? And the third example is looking into um, natural systems and actually do we really have to go to these very advanced treatment systems or can we potentially take advantage of nature to, to uh, ob obtain an advanced treatment based on these, uh, for example, wetland systems? Okay. Um, when we think about um, the sludge treatment, and that's the graph that I showed before, um, and I just want to focus now on acyclovir. So what I, what I should, that's the same graph I showed you before. So for acyclovir, which is highlighted here, we saw that we have these very high concentrations in the influence um, of uh, almost two micrograms per liter. When we compare it to the effluent, we see that, that it's mostly gone. 95%, more than 95% of these compounds are eliminated. The question, though, for me at this point was, uh, what is actually happening to this compound? Because I knew it's, it's, it's a very polar compound, so sorption to sludge, for example, doesn't play a role. So it must be degraded. And the question for me really was, what is, this, what is happening to this compound in terms of degradation? Is it mineral, mineralized, which would, of course, be the ideal outcome, or is it just simply transformed to a, to a different compound? And to investigate this, we looked into, um, the, or this is the general procedure that we are, that we, we are using to look into this, these aspects. So we're doing these uh, lab studies in these little batch reactors um, where we have like diluted activated sludge and we spike our compounds in there, typically at high concentrations. Then we incubate the sample. After the incubation, we um, filter the sample to obtain the water phase. The water phase is then uh, freeze dried to concentrate basically. Um, down to a few milliliters and these few milliliters and then injected into a semi-preparative HPC UV system, uh, which is coupled to a fraction collector. And what that allows us to is to separate or to isolate all the different tr transformation products that are being formed. And after these uh, fraction collection, we then freeze dry again the individual fractions and hopefully the, the purified transformation products. And these, these standards can then be used both for the identification of transformation products, but also, um, and that's a very important aspect for the quantification actually of these transformation products in the environment. Because in most cases, we don't have, there are no analytical standards that are available for these compounds. The, the, the technologies that we're using for the identification of these transformation products are um, high resolution mass spectrometry. So my lab here at Johns Hopkins, we have a so-called Q-Executive HF, which is an Orbitrap high resolution mass spectrometer. Um, what it allows us is to, um, to determine the exact masses. So you can basically say, uh, come up with the sum formula of your compounds, but you can also do a a fragmentation experiments in the mass spec that gives you an information of the chemical structure and the changes that, that, that are happening. Um, and in addition, we also do uh, NMR, both 1D and 2D NMR. And what this technique really allows you to do is get a, an exact 3D um, picture of your compound. So you can, for example, if you have a hydroxylation of your molecule, you can exactly say at which point of your molecule is uh, hydroxylation taking place. All right, but coming back to the, to the, to the results um, or the batch experiments for acyclovir, um, which are shown here. So what we saw for acyclovir in these batch experiments is exactly what we saw in the wastewater treatment plants, that we see this very fast removal of acyclovir, which is here shown in gray. Um, but what we saw is that this removal is leading to the formation of one single transformation product, carboxyacyclovir, which is shown here in green. Um, what you can see here from the chemical structure it's a very minor um, chemical change that is happening. All, all that is taking place is the oxidation of this hydroxy group to the carboxylic acid. And what you also can see from this graph is that this compound is fairly stable. So it doesn't degrade any further in these systems. Um, based on these results, we then went back into the wastewater treatment plant and actually sampled it again, the influent and the effluent. And similar to what I showed before, acyclovir is present at two micrograms per liter in this case. We, we see a, a removal of 93%. So based on that, just thinking about removal, we would say our treatment plant does an excellent job. But when we look at the transformation product, carboxy acyclovir, where we see a different picture, and actually that it's similar to what we saw before, this is formed. So when we do the overall mass balance, we actually see that 
acyclovir isn't really completely removed, but it's really only transformed to this one transformation product. Um, and we see concentrations that are up to 2.4 micrograms per liter in the effluent of this transformation product. Just to give you a better sense of why do we really care about this, both for the environment, but also in terms of human exposure is um, just very briefly, we did, after that, we did a study where we looked into a transect from surface water to groundwater into drinking water. And what was very interesting, and that's the take home message here is really that while acyclovir, we could detect it in low concentrations of surface water, it wasn't present anymore in groundwater or in drinking water, but we could even detect, um, in, in drinking water, we could detect carboxy acyclovir, the transformation product, at a, uh, at a concentration of 40 nanograms per liter, which shows that this compound is really persistent and there is a human exposure uh, via drinking water. All right, um, so what, what can we actually do? And especially, um, as, uh, as has been said in the introduction, I've, I did my PhD in Germany and in Europe, advanced wastewater treatment uh, is currently a big, very big topic. Um, where we, with the reason of really uh, eliminating these micropollutants. And a study that we participated in, or I participated in, was looking into advanced treatment using ozone, which is shown here. So um, just to explain the graph, so you see here a normal wastewater treatment plant with a denitrification, nitrification unit, a secondary clarifier. And um, this uh, pilot um, plant was then equipped with an ozone system. And after this ozone system, we have two uh, two different filter units. One is GAC, which is granular activated carbon, and the other ones are biofilters, which is basically sand uh, with, uh, with microorganisms that are grown on, on the sand. And when we look at general different micropollutants that we were looking at, that we were analyzing, such as the benzotriazole, so these are the corrosion inhibitors, then we have also a bunch of different uh, X-ray contrast media like iomeprol or diatrizoate. What you can see when you look at the influent and effluent, so these are still in the effluent present at very high concentrations, up to eight micrograms per liter. And then when we, when we look at the post-treatments or these advanced treatment, that's again, the, the aim of this post-treatment is really to eliminate all these micropollutants. We can see that um, most of these um, post-treatments really do an excellent job, um, at least for compounds like carbamazepine, which is shown in, gray, uh, in green here, which is completely eliminated. There are still some compounds like diatrizoate, which is in purple here, um, which is not completely eliminated, but these post-treatments definitely do a pretty good job in removing most of these micropollutants. The question again is what are actually these, um, especially the ozonation step, what does it actually do in terms of transformation products? And um, my own studies had shown that um, carboxy acyclovir, which is the biotransformation product that I've showed before, is actually transformed again in ozonation into yet another transformation product, which is shown here on the right side when we, we call it COFA, just the, the abbreviation of the, the, the long chemical name. Um, so when we looked into these treatment systems for these three compounds, what we saw is again, influent and effluent of the conventional treatment, similar to what we saw before. Acyclovir is eliminated pretty efficiently and we see the formation of carboxy acyclovir, which is shown in red. When, when we then use um, ozone, we actually see that similar, again, what we saw in the lab experiments, COFA is formed to a very high extent. 84% of the mass balance um, are accounted for by COFA, and both acyclovir and carboxyacyclovir uh, are completely eliminated. What was very interesting with the post-treatment, and the post-treatment, again, um, is the, the, the main reason for the post-treatment is also to remove any uh, transformation products that are formed during ozonation, what you can see here is that COFA basically isn't eliminated at all, which indicates that this compound is fairly, is, is, is stable in terms of biodegradation, which would be removed in the, in the biofilters, but it's also very, very polar. So that's why we don't see any removal in the activated carbon treatment. The interesting thing is that if we would just use activated carbon treatment, in this, in this case at least, instead of ozonation, you would, you would get a, a large removal of acyclovir and carboxy acyclovir, and you wouldn't form any of these transformation products. Um, so in this case, just using activated carbon itself would definitely be um, the preferred treatment technology, at least for these two compounds. And again, the implications of this, these results are, and that's a study we did together with um, some um, ecotoxicology um, researchers, where we looked into the, the the, the, the toxicity, in this case, to green algae, 
which is shown here. Um, what we saw basically is that we, which is shown here in the graph, that we didn't see any effects of acyclovir or carboxy acyclovir on these green algae. But when we exposed the green algae to the ozonation product, we actually basically killed all the algae that were present. And that is very relevant when we think about the relevance of transformation products because they can actually, which is shown here, they can be more toxic than the parent compound. And that's why I think, in my opinion, they are very important to consider. All right, the, the, the last example I wanna give is dealing with um, open uh, natural treatment system. That's actually a study I did um, um, in, in, in Berkeley in California as part of an NSF program, uh, the NSF Center Renew It, which is uh, standing for reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure. It's a very big um, NSF center between Berkeley, Stanford, uh, New Mexico, uh, 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 New Mexico University and Colorado School of Mines. And um, one, one treatment system that we looked into was the, were these open uh, uh, water wetlands. And they are called open water because as you can see, there are no plants in them. So these are, this is kind of a distinction to the, the, the normal wetlands that you might know, um, which have vegetation in them. These are, open, these are open wetlands. And the aim of these wetlands is actually, they are generally like 20 to 30 centimeter deep, is that you have a complete penetration of sunlight through these um, wetlands which allows uh, photo transformation. But then also on the bottom, because the, treat the treatment system uh, receives wastewater effluent, so there are nutrients, a lot of nutrients and organic compounds that come into it, you also have a biomat that grows. And this biomat is algae uh, diatoms that grow at the bottom of these wetlands. So you, and I found, or the, the reason why I became really interested in, in the system is that um, it's a very nice example where you actually have two different uh, the degradation or transformation processes that take place at the same time. Which is in contrast to what, when you think about our treatment systems where you typically have one step after the other. In this case, you have two at the same time. Um, to start with, I looked into the photo transformation. I'm just gonna give um, one example of a different compound, so not acyclovir, but abacavir, which is shown here, which is used for a treatment of HIV. Um, when we did a lab experiment uh, in the wetland water with a sunlight simulator, what we saw is that abacavir is removed pretty efficiently in these treatment systems with a half uh, photo degradation half lifetime of only 1.2 hours, which is shown here. Um, again, my main interest was in thinking about, okay, what, what are actually the transformation products that are being formed? And in this case, I used a bit of a different approach and I looked into structural similar compounds. Um, so abacavir, such as many other, um, uh, antiviral drugs are DNA based analogs, so modified DNA bases. So what I did is I looked into um, these uh, amino adenosine um, and adenine. And adenine is, uh, part, is a very important uh, part of our DNA. And what you can see is when you compare the, the, the photodegradation kinetics for these two compounds is that we basically didn't see a removal at all. And what it, what it showed me is when you look at the chemical structure is that for abacavir, this cyclopropyl um, moiety that is indicated up here must really be the, the, the moiety in the molecule that is relevant for this fast photo degradation. So that was for me a very good indication using now a high resolution mass spectrometry, what uh, structural modifications should I look for? And this is always very helpful when you do these experiments. So when we, and when we, when we used um, high resolution mass spectrometry, we could indeed confirm based on the transformation products that we found, and we found four in total, that this uh, cyclopropyl moiety up here is really the relevant um, part of the molecule that can be photodegraded. And we were able to identify these four phototransformation products. Um, interestingly, as I said, it's not only phototransformation, but it's also biotransformation that can take place. And um, similar to what I showed before for acyclovir, also abacavir has this uh, hydroxy group here. And we did a study actually that was published in 2016 in water research, um, where we looked into um, the, the biodegradation of abacavir and also a couple of other um, antiviral drugs. And what we saw for all of these, similar to acyclovir, and they all have these hydroxy groups here, that the main, the main transformation of all of them is that this hydroxy group gets oxidized to the corresponding carboxylic acid, which is just to show you here for abacavir, so you see, Abacavir, um, the parent compound is only coming in at a relatively small uh, percentage. So it's already metabolized in the human body, in this case, uh, to the carboxylate. 
But then in the effluent, which is shown here, like or indicated by blue, we basically only uh, see the, the carboxylate transformation products. And what was interesting when you when you when you now look at all the the photo transformation products, that this hydroxy group is of course not only present in the parent compound, but it's also still present in these um, in all the photo transformation products because the the photo transformation is taking place at a different part of the molecule. So of course it was kind of um, a good indication. So maybe we see the exact same photo, uh, sorry, the same biodegradation reaction that we see for Abacabir. Maybe that takes place for the, all the photo transformation products as well. And we could indeed confirm that, um, which is shown here. So on top, the top part of the graphs, you see the degradation kinetics of Abacabir as well as the four different um, photo degradation products. And in, at the bottom, you see that we could detect um, indeed all the different carboxylates that are formed. And what this allows us is to come up with these um, transformation pathways. Um, in this case, combining both photo and bio uh, transformation. And I mean, I think it's, I just, it, I personally, I mean, I'm a chemist, so I think it's just, it's beautiful, but it also, I hope it shows you how complex these systems can get. And this is just looking at a single compound, um, Abakavir. And when you think about the very beginning of the, of my talk, um, and the numbers that I showed you, and especially in terms of the household chemicals, the more than 80,000 household chemicals that we're using, we're really struggling um, with how do we deal with these large amounts of chemicals, but then even higher amounts potentially of transformation products. So, but I hope I could show you um, based on these studies, and there are a lot of others also of different other parts of the water cycle, the transformation products are really um, a big concern. And then um, in my opinion, we, and that's what I call, we, or I call for basically a, re, a redefinement of how we assess actually our wastewater treatment. Because in the past, what we've done is um, we basically evaluated the treatment efficiencies based on the removal of certain contaminants. And that's still, even with the modern technologies such as ozone activated, uh, or um, yeah, ozone, for example, it's still, it's still the, the method of choice. But I hope I could show you that we really have to think about transformation products because in most cases, even though mineralization is the goal, that's not really the case. But we end up with these large amounts of or less, um, yeah, diversity of transformation products. Another aspect is just based on these sheer numbers of different compounds that we also really have to think about how can we evaluate um, these different transformation products. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, it's really not it's not feasible to investigate every single compound um, that is present in our wastewater and their potential toxicity. But we really have to think about new approaches that allow us to differentiate between um, benign or non-toxic transformation products that might be present, but we don't really have to worry about them because they, they don't possess any harm um, to us or the environment. And we really need to narrow down more our methods on, identif on the identification of potentially toxic transformation products. And um, one, one thing that we did, and it's a review we wrote in 2015 and we published in Water Research and um, giving this kind of as a, I think it's an, it's, a, it's an interesting and important read where we actually uh, work together with ecotoxicologists where we try to, um, to review how are we actually assessing oh, the wastewater treatment that we are, uh, or the wastewater treatment uh, plants or systems that we're using today. I'm, I've, I've, I've talked a lot today about the chemistry, but again, this is very uh, important also in terms of the, the toxicity, the different toxicity assays that we're using. And, and as one aspect that is not con uh, part of that uh, review, but it's also becoming more important is uh, more and more important is the, the microbiology. When you think about pathogens or especially more recently, the antibiotic resistance genes. And in my opinion, we really have to come up with new approaches that combine all these different approaches to uh, holistically assess the water treatment. All right, and with that, I'm at the end of my uh, lecture for today. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. I guess we have given us some uh, very um, fundamental idea of what's going on about this water treatment plant regarding to the uh, microbiome removal. So, welcome for any questions. No questions? I guess the video. <laughs> Are there any questions from the students? Audience? 
Okay, Hi. if you know, I mean, oh, yes, please. Hi. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm sorry. Uh, Hi, I, I, I just was almost finished the, uh, the, the presentation already. I, I want to ask, uh, uh, when do you use activated carbon to treat those uh, pharmaceutical compounds and they have a lot of error happen during the experimental results? Well, um, are you are you referring are you referring to the graph that I showed? Yes, yes, the back graph that you showed. Uh, yeah. I okay. saw some people data they have very huge color bar. Yes. I I am do the model to predict the absorption isotherm yeah. of those PPCP using activated carbon. And yeah. I don't understand sometimes some data have a very huge error bar. I don't, I just want to know why. Yeah, well, that's a, it's actually a very good question. So in my, in my case, I can tell you the error bars and I, I'm, not sure, um, I'm, I'm not sure which study you are um, exactly talking or which other studies you are talking about. But this study that we, I showed you is a real, um, it's a pilot system, right? And the, the, the values that I showed is uh, over a period where we sampled um, on a weekly basis over 13 weeks. Um, so there's, so a lot of variety in our case comes just from the fluctuations of the wastewater that comes in because the wastewater quality changes quite a bit over the course of a week or in this case we looked uh, into uh, into uh, the wastewater for more than three months mm -hmm. so um that's where a lot of the variation definitely comes from mm -hmm. another issue with the activated carbon is that um and that's something that people have, have observed is that it's uh, activated carbon can be surprisingly um, heterogeneous so if you if you get a batch of uh, activated carbon and you just for example take um, some from the top and compare it with some of the bottom of your of your bottle you might actually get different results because the, um, you might get different size distribution so there's there's quite a bit of uh, heterogeneity um, um, associated with that so that's that might be one one part why you see um, bigger arrow bars that you would potentially expect. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. Um, so let's see this. I think there's a, um, a question from Sarah in the, in the chat. Um, huh. Well, that's actually, that's a very good, um, no, so that's, a, that's actually a very good uh, example. Um, I, and I, I didn't mention that. No, so the concentrations were higher than what you would typically see in the, in the wastewater treatment plants. Um, the reason why we did this, and that's why I, why I emphasized um, the, when you, that's why we compared it to the parent compounds is to show that we actually can get an increased toxicity. One problem with a lot of these um, toxicity assays, um, that's definitely a, a lot of where at least my frustration with them comes from is, is definitely sensitivity. Um, so the effects, and, and when you think about these micropollutants, um, the environment, but also we, if we are exposed to them, for example, through drinking water, we're exposed to them at very low concentrations over decades, um, for example. And we don't really have any test systems that um, address this issue because the typical uh, tests that we use, they address acute toxicity, for example. Um, so that's definitely a very big issue. Um, and in this case, that's why also, um, yeah, our concentrations were definitely higher orders of magnitude higher than what you would typically see in a wastewater treatment plants. Um, so the second question is also to the, uh, from Verena is also addressing the, the ecotox. Um, we, I, well, I only showed the results of green algae. We actually did more. Um, and one, one interesting other example is actually that I didn't include is that the biotransformation product actually showed the toxicity towards Daf Daphnia magna. Um, whereas both the parent compound acyclovir and the ozonation product did not. So that um, was an, is also an interesting aspect where actually you can have a change of toxicity depending on what transformation you are, you're looking at. Um, so, um, yeah. So again, we did, we did the, uh, the Daphnia. Uh, we didn't see any effect for the ozonation product for Daphnia, but we saw a clear toxicity um, of the biotransformation product. Um, we, we collaborate with different people and typically labs have, um, they have a, a standard set almost of different um, toxicity assays. 
So that's why, for example, we didn't look into fish because they didn't do that. Um, okay, then um, there's another question about, oh yeah, so acyclovir. Um, so the reason why we didn't detect um, acyclovir, or we detected it at small concentrations in surface water, but not in uh, groundwater or drinking water is that it's uh, biodegraded further. So of course also you have microorganisms that are present in surface waters, you have them also present in groundwater. So the reason why we didn't detect it in, um, in groundwater drinking water is simply because um, it was eliminated at least below the limit of detection for us. So there might have been still be very small amounts present, but we couldn't detect it. So that's the reason why um, it wasn't, um, yeah, um, why it wasn't detected anymore. All right. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, this is Ed Bauer. Karsten, thanks yeah. for your nice talk. Uh, let's look a little bit, and so you've, you've sort of looked at situations where you, the compounds are there and you're looking at their behavior. Are you also thinking about trying to detect new contaminants? I, I give an example like the PFOAs and PFOS. Right. We use those as flame retardants for decades, and now all of a sudden we know they're a big problem. Right. Is there some other group of compounds like that that may be on the horizon that we can try to be proactive and prevent uh, their problems? Well, I mean, well, I mean, that's that's kind of the problem. There are so many out there. I mean, there are a lot of examples that I can think of. There are a lot of we we we, are, we use a lot of dyes in our um, um, in different in the industry, but also in in, in households or different products. Um, Flame retardants are definitely yeah um, a big a big issue. Um, industrial all different kinds of industrial chemicals that are also related or associated with new technologies that we are inventing. Um, for example, compounds that stem from um, um, photo, photo, photovoltaic um, like solar cells. Um, then agricultural chemicals are um, definitely always a big issue, just because um, like pesticides they are designed to be very toxic to um, organisms. I mean, mostly um, to, um, um, yeah, that are related to agriculture, but of course also they could potentially harm um, humans and other um, non-target organisms. So um, yeah, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of different compounds. One, one approach that people are using more and more, and that's also that something that we are addressing is actually going away from specifically searching for contaminants and looking more into um, an approach called non-target analysis where we basically screen water samples um, for all the different compounds that are present to identify unknown compounds that um, we haven't detected before. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, okay um, so there, there are a couple of hours. So Sarah, Sarah is asking, um, with the GAC treatment, so as I said, exactly. So um, the the COFA production can be prevented when we use uh, GAC. The problem is, of course, the GAC um, isn't the ultimate. It's also not the ultimate treatment method because you have compounds that come in that are that are polar that are not eliminated by GAC. Um, and for example, um, even the the X-ray contrast media, which definitely are a big um, issue because they they occur in pretty high concentrations. Um, they are also not completely eliminated by activated carbon, at least um, some of them. Um, then Doug asked um, about uh, the percentage of wastewater treatment plants in Europe that have advanced treatment. So that's a very good question and that's varies widely um, across the, the globe. So um, in Europe, I can give you the example, especially Switzerland. So Switzerland is kind of at the at the forefront of the developments um, because they, they passed a law a few years ago where they actually um, regulated that 80% um, of micropollutants and they, they selected a, a suit of different uh, micropollutants ha have to be eliminated by 80% by either using, um, well, they are mostly focusing on either activated carbon or ozonation. Um, and they are implementing it now on a, on a large scale um, with the, the 100 biggest wastewater treatment plants. Um, the reason why Switzerland can do that is that with these hundred um, wastewater treatment plants, they cover 70 to 80 percent of the population. Just because the way Switzerland is a small country and most of the people live in, in big cities like Zurich, 
for example. Um, in Germany, on the other hand, where um, I participated in, and one of the reasons why we did this, um, 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 these investigations was actually that Germany is also thinking in a similar direction. The problem in Germany is that we have way more smaller treatment plants. So the implementation of these technologies in Germany would be um, a, a gi gigantic amount of money. And um, as far as I remember in Switzerland, the uh, money that they are investing is 1 billion uh, Swiss francs um, to, to upgrade these wastewater treatment plants. In Germany, just because of, as I said, the way wastewater treatment plants are located in Germany would be much higher. Um, so that's why um, it's very, it, it, it varies quite a bit. And then on a, on a, on a global perspective, um, it also really depends on where the water is coming from. So I, um, I've spent the last three years before I came to, to Johns Hopkins, I was at Berkeley in, in California because of the drought faces a lot of issues. And I mean, you guys have already heard uh, in a previous lecture about water reuse. So ozonation or other advanced treatment technologies are definitely a core in these water reuse scenarios. Um, so yeah, so I hope Doug that answers, that answers your questions. Um, so um, the regulation or the policy part um, is definitely also a very important aspect um, and very interesting. Um, so in Germany or in Europe, there, um, there was an attempt to include um, different pharmaceuticals um, such as endocrine disruptors um, like uh, estrogens, for example, into um, law and to regulate them or diclofenac was another one. Um, but it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't get through because some countries were really worried that um, because the, the conventional treatment doesn't do a good job, that the, the receiving waters, and that, that was mostly, uh, con the concern was mostly the receiving waters, the concentrations would be too high so that they would have to upgrade all of their treatment plants. And that's, again, a huge cost issue. Um, so that's why um, at this point, unfortunately, there is not a real regulation when it comes to the wastewater. Um, not yet, um, but I'm hoping that will change in the future. But it's a, it's a very sensitive uh, topic um, just because of the, the amount of money that would be involved with that. Um, so, and then there's Verena asked about Sarah's last comment. Um, right, so Verena, actually, I really like your comment. And so I think, I hope everybody can read it, but that's exactly the, the point that I wanted to make. So the, the take home message is that there is not the ultimate method, treatment method. And I, I don't think it will ever exist. There will always be advantages or disadvantages. And of course, there are the treatment technologies. We also have to look into the, for other aspects like energy consumption. And these of course play a very big role. Ozonation, activated carbon, they're all very uh, cost intensive and ener energy intensive, especially the ozonation. So there's always kind of this back, this, um, this um, evaluation of um, what is the best approach. My, um, my point that I wanted to make is really that based on what we do so far is really just looking at the elimination of certain contaminants that this is only part of the story. We really have to look into transformation products and we really have to come up with methods that allow us to assess um, the quality of the water, of the treated water on a, on a very more holistic basis, including ecotoxicity, but also including potential exposure to humans um, if these compounds travel into our drinking water. Yeah. I don't see, I don't see any. Are there any questions? If no, I think it's about one hour. So thank you so much, Kirsten, for the very nice presentation. I did learn a lot. So I think okay. the students also a lot from your uh, yeah. experience. Thank you so much. And thank you for, so, the, for yeah. yeah, sorry. Thank you for the for the opportunity and thank you for the great questions. They were really um yeah, they were really good questions. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So guys, so have you maybe I'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you very much. Thank you.